Hi, I'm Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living, where each week I bring you the latest information on how to live a healthy, more vibrant, more passion-driven life. I'm really excited because we have Dr. Sarah Godfrey back today. Now she's been on past episodes talking about how hormones impact every single system in your body. But in today's episode, we're gonna take it one step further because as she points out in her new book, which is called Women, Food and Hormones, Food is the backbone of the hormones you make. So when it comes to your health and your metabolism, food is medicine. In her newest book, Dr. Dr. Gottfried presents this groundbreaking new plan that helps women balance their hormones so they can lose excess weight and feel better. And she also lays the groundwork of how to get your body to flip the switch from burning carbohydrates to burning fat. So let me just give you a little bit about Dr. Godfrey. The list goes on and on, but she's a New York Times bestselling author, Harvard educated women's health expert. And over the past two decades, Sarah has been and has seen over 25,000 patients. And she specializes in identifying the root causes underlying the patient's conditions and really helping them trying to achieve true and lasting health transformation transformations and not just this uh, symptom management, which we hear so much about. So Sarah, it's always a pleasure to have you back. And uh, I'm excited about our discussion today. I love your book. Thank you, Kathy. I'm always happy to be with you. We always have so much fun. <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, so here's, let's just dive in. As you know, your book is about hor the hormone balancing protocol, and it has three tenets. We talk about detoxification, you talk about nutritional ketosis, and intermittent fasting. And what I'd like to start with today is just dive into that second tenet, which is ketosis, because there's so much confusion about keto diets, and they're so popular. And yet, there is controversy, good, bad. You have people that love keto. You have something you call the keto refugees. So why don't we just start to unpack keto and um, start from the beginning. What is a keto diet? Well, let's start with what is ketosis? What are ketones and why a keto diet? Now, a lot to cover. Uh, we can unpack it any way you want, but why don't we just dive in? Well, I, I would say first, the way I think of nutritional ketosis is that your body has a choice. It can either burn carbohydrates or sugar, or it can burn fat. And your body is designed to go back and forth between the two. It's not designed to kind of stay in one place or another such as burning carbs. So with nutritional ketosis, you use your food to drive your metabolism, drive your body to burn fat. So you do that in a few different ways. One is that you limit how many carbohydrates that you eat. So I know you've talked about this in previous podcasts. If you limit your carbohydrates, it then allows you you know, the body detects this and it says, oh, okay, we've got less glucose available. Let's start burning fat. And that process can be really fast in some people. It can take 24 to 48 hours, or it can be a slower process, especially for women who can take a longer time to get into ketosis. So a big part of the book is about how to adapt the ketogenic diet so that it's better for women and not, you know, sort of the one size fits all that I think is what generates a lot of that controversy that you've been talking about. Right. I know that, um, you know, you'll have couples, the man will go on the keto diet, eight pounds, my gosh, <laughs> a week, two weeks, eight pounds. Woman goes on it, kind of feels uncomfortable, uh, doesn't, you know, uh, is it working for her, gets constipated and feels, um, like she wants to tear somebody's head off. So you have <laughs> both sides of this. And, and um, so let's talk about the differences between not just men and women, but within the female category, because we're directing this conversation mainly to females. And I know within the female category, there are the, the body types 
the long leans like myself, you know, we've been, I mean, we've been on stage together. So we, we, we like to talk about body types and, you know, you know, you have your family history, your body type, but everybody who's listening to this has a certain body type. So can we just address how keto impact the difference between men and women, but also the difference between body types? Men and women first, you know, that's that story you just told of a couple that goes on keto was my story. So I went on keto with my husband. We did this before we got married and he dropped 20 pounds. I mean, he looked fantastic in his suit for the wedding. And I, I lost maybe two pounds over the month before our wedding. And I was so frustrated. And so it got me to look at, okay, what's the science of this? Like, why is it that women tend to struggle more than men do? So one reason is testosterone. So testosterone is such an important metabolic hormone. It determines your muscle mass. It determines mood and agency and confidence. It's also known for its role in sex drive and libido. And men have more of it because they've got more testosterone. They've got more muscle mass. If you compare a premenopausal woman to a man, the man has about 50% more muscle mass and about somewhere around 10 to 15% less body fat compared to women. So testosterone is a big part of that difference between men and women, but it means that men have this thing called the testosterone advantage so that they lose weight more easily, frankly, regardless of what they do, but definitely on a ketogenic diet, they lose more fat, they lose more pounds. It happens much more rapidly than what you see in women. Now, another big difference is that women need carbohydrates. We need them for a lot of reasons. We need them to feed our good gut bugs, our microbiome. We need it to sleep well at night. And we know that women have double the rates of insomnia compared to men. We need carbs to help us with mood. We need carbs to help us with thyroid function. Women have seven to 10 times more thyroid issues compared to men. So when it comes to carbs, we need a particular dose that helps these hormones stay in balance, helps us avoid kind of a, a stress response to restricting carbs too much, but we don't want so many that it leads to carb intolerance and issues with insulin, which controls your blood sugar. And then once insulin's out of whack, it just makes you store fat. So those are some of the differences between men and women, all of which we can work around. So we'll talk about how to work around them. And then you also mentioned the differences even within women. So there are some women who have, as you were describing, I call you the celery type. I hope you don't take offense with that. I heard that. <laughs> I, used to be, I used to be called pencil and in your book, it's like celery. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, celery is a really good vegetable. Yeah, so you, you're so tall and lean. You have been, you've had a stable body for so long. And in the time that I've known you, in the time since I first started doing your videos, like, you know, decades ago, between the size that I am now, my body shape has changed quite a bit. And so I've had periods of time where I was a pear shape. So I had more fat at my hips. I've also had some times where I was more of an apple shape where I had more belly fat. And so what we know is that the celery types, almost whatever they do, they're successful because their weight is relatively stable. Their metabolism is really high. The problem comes in with those of us who are the pear shape or the apple shape. So the apple shape are the ones that have more issues with insulin. We've got, you know, that, that visceral fat, which is not just, you know, doesn't just make it hard to zip up our genes. It's metabolically unhealthy for us. So it leads to a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and dementia, all sorts of things that we want to avoid. Those people also have issues with detoxification. So it's just harder for them to get rid of some of those products that they make in their body that can slow down weight loss. So what I find is that the people who are apple shaped, they need to go into a deeper level of nutritional ketosis. They also need more detoxification to help them be successful with keto. So all of this is laid out in the book. What I suggest for the pear-shaped folks, 
which is the shape that I am now, is that they can benefit from a, a lighter degree of ketosis. They can tolerate more carbohydrates when they're uh, on a ketogenic diet. So enough so that their sleep and their thyroid and their stress levels are good, but they also do well with intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting, I think of as kind of a backdoor to ketosis, because if you restrict your food for typically somewhere around 14 to 18 hours, if you don't eat in that period, your, your DNA is designed to start to put you into ketosis. So you run out of carbs to burn for fuel. And so you start burning fat. You burn the fat that in my case is on my hips and my butt. And that's a good thing. We like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. And you know, it's interesting. Um, it's like this puzzle and in every podcast I have with you or Felice Gersh or yeah. you know, Will Bolsowicz or you know, Zach Bush, you start to go down and you start to see these terms that are being repeated over the years and people are trying to, starting to get a better understanding of them and starting to refine them. So the intermittent fasting I know that I've refined through the years from that 13, 14 hours to, as opposed to being 16 hours for men. So now mine is more of a 13 hour, 14 hour, but then where I've really refined it is that is my snacking in between. So I have a meal, but then a lot of us would have that meal. And then we thought where we have this feeding period, we could feed for a full eight hours or whatever as opposed to you have your meal, you stop eating, you have another meal, you know, you stop eating. So mine, my, my turn the corner when I stop snacking as much. So that's one thing I want to point out, but with, with, with the ketosis, what uh, I think everybody that I talk to has uh, tr tr trying to wrap their arms around is this idea of the proportions. So let's get into that for the Godfrey protocol, which is your four week plan. And how much fat, how much protein, and how much carbs? And I kind of am asking these questions. Uh, I know I'm giving a few a few questions in a row, but I, I want you to also start thinking about my, the most confusing thing for me is carbs and then net carbs. So could you just like explain a bit of that to all of us? Yeah, so net carbs are basically the total carbs that you eat less the fiber. So as an example, if you have an avocado and the serving that you have, a, a third of an avocado or a quarter, say that it has uh, seven grams of total carbohydrates, but that serving also has three grams of fiber. So the net carbs would be four grams. So that's an example of how to calculate net carbs. I think it's important if for us to step back for a moment and talk about kind of the spectrum that we see of people who are eating a ketogenic diet. So when keto first became popular, I would say it was with the Atkins diet. So the first two weeks of the Atkins diet was, you know, the steak and the sour cream and not a lot of vegetables. So that first two weeks was a ketogenic diet, but you know, there aren't many nutritionists who would agree that that is healthy for you long-term. And what a lot of folks would uh, label that is lazy keto. So certainly it's effective to help people with burning fat and with losing weight, but there's a cost to it. There's a way that you're not getting the phytonutrients. You're not getting the 50,000 beneficial molecules that you get from plants. So there's lazy keto, which is, you know, the bacon and the fat bombs and a lot of meat, a lot of fat, a lot of um, animal-based fat. And then there's clean keto. Clean keto is what I'm talking about. It's very vegetable dense. So it includes all of those dark green leafies that we love. It includes, you know, at least five different colors of the rainbow in the vegetables that you're consuming. It does limit fruit because that has a lot of carbohydrates. There's some fruits that are an exception like avocados and um, olives, but with a clean ketogenic diet, what you can do is you can still get into nutritional ketosis with 
much more emphasis on plant-based fats. So the avocado oil, the avocado, the olives, the um, I'm a big fan of avocado oil for cooking. Uh, you know, making sure that you're, uh, if you consume fish, that you're getting that wild caught fish that does not have too many um, endocrine disruptors in it. So there's that difference between lazy keto and clean keto. And a lot of the research looking at keto initially started off looking at lazy keto. So keto was first developed more than 100 years ago by a neurologist to help reduce the inflammation in the brain of people with epilepsy. So it was found that a ketogenic diet worked incredibly well. In fact, there are some people who are super responders to it because they can go on a ketogenic diet and they can actually get off of their uh, anti-seizure medications. So there's definitely this effect on the brain. In some ways, ketones, which is what you produce from, from burning fat, ketones are a preferred fuel source for the brain. So maybe we could talk more about that in a moment. But when it comes to you know, the proportion and is it net carbs, is it total carbs? Like how much fat did you say? Did you say 70%? What I advise is that you start with about 60 to 70% of your calories from fat. And for women, especially, I think it's important for that to mostly be plant-based and fish-based fat. And then you layer on the protein. So the ketogenic diet is um, high in fat, moderate in protein. So you basically want to get enough protein so that it preserves your muscle mass. So that typically is about 20% of your calories uh, per day from protein. And then the rest, net carbohydrates. So this again can be differentiated. I recommend in general about 20 to 25 net carbohydrates per day. So that's somewhere around six to eight per meal. And for the people who are uh, the apple shape, those are the women who do better with restricting their carbs a little further temporarily. So about 20 net grams of carbs per day, whereas the uh, pear-shaped can get away with a few more carbs, more like 25. What if you're more physically active? Would you add more carbs or not necessarily? Yeah, so there's a lot of debate about this in the sports medicine world because there are some athletes and some people who are really active physically who just need carbohydrates for their best performance. So there are some athletes who need additional carbohydrates and you can adjust the dose of carbohydrates based on how active you are. Now, there are some athletes who perform at a very high level on a ketogenic diet. But when you look at you know, endurance athletes, people who run long distance, the, uh, the guys that are in the Tour de France, my basketball players that I take care of, what we know is that they can do a ketogenic diet, like if they need that for medical reasons, maybe to help with a blood sugar problem. And then we tend to add carbs back about two weeks before a race or a performance. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to kind of split the difference in sports medicine. So we talked about, um, brain function, the ketones and how it impacts brain function. I was also reading in your book, how it affects mitochondria and aging. And I want to, um, kind of dive into this with a story that I mentioned to you right before we started talking, uh, we, we went on air and that is that my daughter, Kate, and most listeners know that she's an Olympic athlete and over Christmas, so like December 20th, uh, she had gone to a wedding in Chicago. She got back, even though she was uh, vaccinated and boosted, she got COVID. And not only did she get COVID, uh, she also trained pretty hard while she had COVID because she thought it was going to be a two-day situation and she'd be through it. Um, she, got, she became a long hauler and a long hauler for people that out there that don't know, it means that you have symptoms and they don't go away and they impact people differently. Well, Kate got impacted with um, the thinking mitochondria, they, the heart was okay, uh, but, but, the, but the whole, how it manifested is that 
She had a hard time getting out of bed. She went from, she is third in the world right now. She's ranked mm-hmm. third in the world in the 800 meter. And she uh, would go for a five minute walk and have to take a two hour nap. Mm-hmm. And it was just, and then thinking that it was going to resolve itself in two weeks, three weeks, two months later, you know, were checking with all of the facilities around the country, all the, inst- you know, from Harvard and Yale and Stanford and all the medical institutions who are doing uh, studies on long haulers. Fast forward a few weeks ago. So we're now in, uh, that, that was actually, let's just put it in mid-April, I went to see her we got her on a ketogenic, ketogenic diet, a keto diet. Within about two days, symptoms started to resolve. Now I'm not saying that she's out there training at the highest intensity, but she is back training. Th- certain things like her heart rate went back down. She would go for a walk and her heart rate would stay up at 180 uh, beats per minute and not come, come back down. So here's an example of how this diet, how diet became her medicine. And when I was with her, and, and this is what I was, and then I'll finish the story because it was so mind, she goes, I, when I mentioned her, she goes, mom, I'm kind of, I kind of eat, you know, I eat healthy is what she said. I said, yeah, honey, but I noticed that you're just nibbling a lot through the course of the day. Just not much, a bite of like, you know, pancake, a little bit of this, a little taste of this, popping in, whoops, you know, some, you know, some fruit or whatever. And I would just give it a try. And it was mind boggling. So maybe get into how it impacts other systems in our, in our body and why, even if you're not trying to lose weight, it's a powerful diet. Well, first, let me say, I'm so sorry that Kate has gone through this. And I can imagine as a mother, how devastating that has been to watch. I mean, she's just at the peak of her career. So my heart goes out to Kate. I love cheering her on um, in the races that she's in. And I haven't taken care of her, so I don't know the details, but what we know is that uh, there's a few different versions of long haul syndrome. You know, there's some people who have issues with what's known as the autonomic nervous system. So that system that controls your heart rate and controls your blood pressure and your breathing, that can sometimes be disrupted by um, COVID and by the long haul syndrome. So there may be some of that related to what you're describing with our heart rate. And related to that is the neuroinflammation. So this is the level of I think of it almost like a frat party that happens inside your brain. It's not a party that you want to be happening because it leads to brain fog. It leads to a loss of of executive functioning, of cognitive functioning. It leads to extreme fatigue, especially when the mitochondria are involved. So the mitochondria, they're like the power stations in your cell. You know, they, they basically help you, they help you feel fueled It's almost like when you plug in your cell phone and it's fully charged and you're like, ah, like I feel good again. Similar sort of thing with your mitochondria. So it's this battery that just keeps you going in terms of energy, allows you to feel like you're full of energy. So what happens with some people with long haul syndrome is that they they have this neuroinflammation. It's almost like someone turned on this light and they can't get it to turn off again. And those are the people who often benefit from a ketogenic diet. So if we take a step back, what we know with the ketogenic diet is that there's something about the production of ketones, burning more fat, burning less carbohydrates, burning more fat, producing this chemical known as ketones. You can measure it with a finger stick, a beta hydroxy ketone. And that is a preferred fuel for the brain. So there's something about it that seems to reduce that frat party, that inflammation that's happening in the brain, whether that's after COVID or it's in someone with a seizure disorder, or even patients with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, you know, a big part of the precision medicine protocol for patients with Alzheimer's or even early subjective cognitive impairment is to try a ketogenic diet. You can also use it for patients with multiple sclerosis So in some ways, regardless of your weight and your body fat situation, this benefit that happens in the brain is really profound. And I can tell you, I remember when, back when my husband and I first went on ketosis, 
my husband got into keto. He got into ketosis right away. It took me longer because I was a little more carb intolerant. It took me about a week to really get into full ketosis. And then it took me like another few months to really adapt to it. But my husband immediately got into ketosis. His finger pricks were up to 1.0 millimoles per liter, which is um, ketosis. And he was just like, I'm, I have so much mental acuity. Like he had trouble sleeping because he was so energized. His mitochondria were so well fed. He could really focus. He could hyper-focus. He could, you know, just accomplish much more in a day. So that benefit that Kate is describing within 24 to 48 hours, that's something that we see pretty routinely when you turn that light out on the neuroinflammation by using the ketogenic diet. It's so powerful. I have that, that yeah. experience. I, I love, I love when my brain is lit up. Yes. Uh, so let's go through a day uh, uh, on the Godfrey protocol, just so that people understand a couple of things, like maybe a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or what you might eat during a day to stay within that, uh, the, you know, the parameters that you mentioned before with your macronutrients. And then also, well, how will you be checking yourself or what are you recommending? Uh, how many times or how, how do you have to check yourself through the course of the day? And do you pee on a stick or you mentioned your husband pricks his finger when gets some blood. So can you kind of go through a day in the life of the Godfrey protocol, you know, uh, food plan and how you would know you're in ketosis and stay in ketosis. Sure. So I'll give you kind of the simple version and then I'll give you the more advanced version because there's a, a range here. So the, the simplest version is to start to get familiar with macronutrients and with what's known as calculating your macros. So I know you spoke to a previous guest about this who described it really beautifully. You can use an app like MyFitnessPal or something like that to determine maybe with some of your favorite meals, how many net carbs are in there, how much fat, how much protein, so that you can hit those macros, which are high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. So what I do with each meal, I basically eat about two meals a day. I try to get somewhere around seven to 10 net grams of carbohydrates in each of those meals. So a typical breakfast for me, I love scrambles. So I'll make a scramble of vegetables. Today, what I had was red pepper. I had some broccolini, about a cup of it. I had some chopped spinach. I put some onion and garlic in there because those are great detoxifiers. They help to raise something called glutathione, which really helps your mitochondria. It's an antioxidant in the body. So I, I cut all of those up, mix them in some avocado oil, sauteed them, and then I added a couple of pastured eggs. So for me, that's like the perfect breakfast. Some people, depending on your body size, you might need another egg um, for men as an example, but that's a really good meal for me. And you can add, if you need to try to increase the amount of oil that you're getting, because that's often the difficult adjustment for people, you could add another tablespoon of MCT oil. What a lot of people do in, keto in ketosis, and I heard another guest of yours talk about this too, is they start their day with coffee or green tea with some MCT oil or with some other fat to really help to produce ketones. MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil, is a great way to increase the amount of ketones that you make, especially for people who are first making that transition from eating mostly carbs to eating mostly fat. So it can help to hasten that transition. It's also associated with less hunger. And I also recommend for people who are first starting to not have any alcohol and MCT oil can help you with cravings that you might have, you know, especially during the pandemic, you start to look at your watch around six and wonder when you're going to have a glass of wine. So the MCT oil around 2 PM can help you with that. So that's one meal. A second meal, which uh, I made yesterday was to use miracle noodles. So I'm a big fan of miracle noodles. They're made from sweet potato, Japanese sweet potato. They're zero carbs, but they come shaped in different pastas. So I miss pasta when I'm on a ketogenic diet. And so this is a great 
way to make an alternative. You could also spiralize vegetables. You know, you could do that with squash or with uh, zucchini. You could make pasta out of vegetables. But I made a ragu yesterday that was so delicious. So it had some chopped celery, onions, garlic. It's a Marcella Hazan um, recipe that I learned when I was in college. And I use some venison in it because I'm someone who tends to be low in iron. So I made this low carb ragu and then I made this pasta, put the ragu on top of the miracle noodles, which are no carb. And then I added some additional um, uh, vegetables on top of that. And I always eat a big salad. So I typically have that for dinner around five o'clock. I'm just a salad girl. I just love, you know, kind of, I feel like salads can, they can carry you so far because you can really rotate the type of species that are in the salads. You can make all different kinds of salad um, dressings. You can use really healthy oils in your salad dressings. You can add some additional fats like nuts and seeds. You can add your favorite protein. So I think Kathy, in terms of templates, that's my scramble template for breakfast. And that's my, you know, kind of low carb pasta with salad template for dinner. Yeah, I like this idea of having these templates that you can just uh, then different vegetables, different protein. I just got introduced to walnut oil, which uh, it was very tasty. And, you know, I was making some salad dressings with that. Plus, I, you have this secret weapon you have in the book, which is your soup, which I'm looking forward to making. Uh, and it's just full of all these vegetables, right? It's just a, a really it's, powerful. That's exactly right. I mean, there's, yeah, the soup template is especially good for people who are first beginning because what I find a lot of people do, especially if you're working at some workplace that's not at your home, what I see a lot of people do is they have a small breakfast and then they have maybe a small lunch and then they're so hungry by the time dinner comes because they're not yet in ketosis. When you make ketones, it is satisfying. So you're not hungry, but while you're in that transition from burning carbs to burning fat, you can get super hungry at dinner. And that's when people often will screw up. Like that's where they make the mistake of starting to eat more carbs because they're just more readily available. So I'm a big fan of soups. We've got a lot of soup recipes in the book. I've got um, some cases of like a woman who's of Southeast Asian descent. She added a bunch of soup recipes. You can basically take your favorite recipe and make it lower carb so that it fits within this template. So a um, couple questions. One, I know, because when I was asking people in my Facebook group, what, what kind of questions they want me to ask you, one thing that came up is, what if you are vegan or completely plant-based? Is it possible to do a ketogenic diet if you're plant-based? It absolutely is. So, you know, I think initially with the lazy keto emphasis, a lot of people felt left out of that equation. They didn't feel like if they were plant-based, vegan or vegetarian, that they could do it, but you most certainly can because it comes down to those macronutrients. Now, I'll be honest, I think it's a little bit harder if you're vegan to follow those macronutrients because so many of the protein sources end up being a little more carby when it comes to trying to hit those macros. So it was important to me when I wrote this book that I included vegans, that I included people who are 100% vegetarian so that we could document that they were able to get into ketosis and to stay in ketosis for four weeks. Now, the great thing about being plant-based is that if you're eating a lot of vegetables already, that detoxification, that's the first part of the Gottfried protocol, you kind of have it covered. I mean, maybe you might need to add some extra colors to make sure that you've got all the phytonutrients that you want to have for your metabolic health and your immune health, but you can absolutely do it. And so I'm an omnivore. I eat pretty much everything, but what I did for this book is I went on, I went 100% vegan keto for two weeks just to make sure that I could stay in ketosis. And I, I found it was not difficult. Now, one of the crutches I used, I'll throw another template in here, is that I used shakes when I was doing vegan keto. So I found that to be very helpful. I used a, you know, a vegan um, protein 
uh, powder combined with MCT oil. I added some additional greens and like steamed cauliflower. And then I would add some nuts and seeds to kind of get that richness and creaminess that I like in a shake. So that can be, I think, a helpful swap or um, add on to help you if you want to be vegan or 100% plant-based. And so if you are, let me see if I have this uh, correct. And that is if I am eating 35 grams of fiber, 40 grams of fiber, then I can basically be eating closer to 65 grams uh, or 60 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, so, and, and so that gives me a little bit more wiggle room as, as a vegan. It does. So this is where the second part of your question comes in, which is tracking and seeing if this is working for you. So what a lot of people do when they go on a, a food plan like this is they just measure their weight. Maybe they do it every day. And that's one of the worst measures we have of your metabolic health. So what I prefer is that you check your ketones in the morning. So you could just prick your finger once a day, look at your ketones and look at your glucose. So the two together give you a lot of information about your metabolic health. What we want is a fasting glucose of about 70 to 85 milligrams per deciliter. That's what we know is the optimal range for people who do not have insulin resistance, who have normal metabolic health. Once you get above that, even though it's not quite the criteria that we use for prediabetes in conventional medicine, but once your glucose is 86, 87, 90, 95, and then up in the prediabetes range, which is 100 to 125, that shows that you have insulin resistance. So going back to your question, Dialing in the net carbohydrates, what I generally recommend is starting at around 20 to 25 net grams of carbs per day. For people who exercise more like you do, I've been with you to uh, yoga and to the gym, I know how much you exercise. Often you can get away with eating more carbs. People who are more stressed sometimes need more carbs. So you have to, you have to eat a certain amount I recommend starting at 20 grams of net carbs per day. And then you test with a finger prick, whether you're in ketosis. So one other thing that happens that I think is important to mention is that when you're transitioning from burning sugar, burning carbs to burning fat, it's almost like a hybrid car kind of going back and forth between the two. You can have this period of adjustment, which is known as keto flu. And that's where you can feel kind of headachey and have more cravings and you can feel more tired, might be harder to sleep. And so there's ways to try to prevent keto flu, things like taking the MCT oil that I mentioned. Um, but in terms of dialing it in, what we would wanna know is if you consume what you just described, like 35 grams of fiber, a total of 60 grams total carbs per day, mostly from vegetables, then we'd wanna check your ketones the next day and every day to see if you're in ketosis. And for you, a very light level of ketosis, I think would be appropriate. Right, I mean, I have to tell you, since I have uh, switched into this metabolic flexibility, which you talk about in your book, which is the goal of all this. So, I mean, why, why, don't, you, why don't you just uh, mention the benefits of me metabolic flexibility so that, people understand that it's just not about weight loss. It's about brain function, mitochondria, energy, aging, all of these other facets that, that keep me in a place where I love this kind of balancing act and that you can, if you're, if I'm traveling, I'm going to Greece in about two weeks for a wedding. And, um, you know, I, obviously I'm going to be eating, uh, Greek salads and all kinds of yummy things. I, I mean, all of these oils and fish and whatever. And then I'll be in London for a birthday party and my diet might change a little bit. I still stay within guidelines, but I can burn carbs or we might be tra uh, walking around the city all day long and we can't stop to eat. And I don't get into 
the hangry mode. I, I just like my body just switches over like, okay, burn some fat now. And it actually not, it, it actually the opposite is true uh, for me in the sense that instead of getting hangry, I get more alert, I get more energized. Um, so explain uh, maybe just to wrap up a little bit here, metabolic flexibility and why it's so powerful. Well, the problem is most Americans are not metabolically flexible. So most Americans are metabolically unhealthy and that's 88% of Americans. So only about 12% of us are in the category that you're describing where you've got metabolic flexibility, meaning that like a hybrid car that burns gas or burns, you know, uses the battery and electricity kind of as needed, you are like the hybrid car. So you can flip back and forth. You could go to Greece and you could hike all day and you could have your um, fresh fish and your Greek salad, and you could burn fat and actually find that you've got that increased mental acuity. And then you could go to somewhere like London or to France. I think of that as the carb capital <laughs> or Italy. You could go there and you could eat more carbs, but you could actually tolerate it without it hurting your metabolic health. Now you mentioned hangry and that immediately takes me back to when I was in my thirties, I had a couple of kids. I had borderline glucose issues with both of my pregnancies, not gestational diabetes, but like one point below the cutoff. And what happened then for me was that my glucose was borderline. Even after having kids, I would crave carbs all the time. I was one of those people who would have almonds and like other things in my purse because I would get hypoglycemic. And I would just feel, you know, that hangry feeling of just being irritable and like, I got to stick something in my mouth. And I thought the solution then, I mean, this was a while ago, 20 years ago, I thought the solution then was just to eat more and to eat more continuously, but that does not really heal your metabolism. What heals your metabolism is to have this flexibility, just like a hybrid car to burn gas or to burn electricity, kind of depending on what's available. So I was stuck in that glucose burning mode when I was in my thirties. No one told me about it. It wasn't until I started testing myself that I realized, oh, I've got a fasting glucose of 105. That is pre-diabetes. My fasting insulin is elevated. It was up in the twenties. And so I got very determined to fix this because I, was knew, I knew I was heading in the direction of developing diabetes of, you know, I've got Alzheimer's in my family. I felt like I was putting myself at an increased risk of that. And so I wanted to turn the ship around. So I got very focused on, okay, what could I eat to really improve my metabolic flexibility? And there were two diets that were in the literature. The first was 100% plant-based. And I tried that for a while but I, I was hungry all the time on it, Kathy. I just found that I needed some animal protein. That was the best thing for me. And then the second option was the ketogenic diet. So I went on a ketogenic diet. I healed my metabolism. I reversed my prediabetes. I no longer ever feel hangry. I eat, you know, maybe after five hours, after, you know, my two meals a day, I'll have my second meal five hours after my first one but I could take it or leave it. Like I'm not, I'm not like, you know, white knuckling like I used to be. So when you have that metabolic flexibility, you've got this freedom, you've got kind of food freedom to choose the food that's going to be the most nourishing for you. And I think that is so powerful. Right. And that term freedom, that's what I, that's what resonates with me. And the other thing is, um, you know, I just feel that 20 years ago, when you were talking about when you're trying these diets, we had a certain amount of knowledge. The amount of information, knowledge, and, and the amount of technology we have right now to know what's happening inside your body. And this is what I'm going to close with, and I'm going to give you one closing, and then we'll wrap it up because I know you're busy. But what I am just feeling every single day, week, month is that we have the ability with a strip or a little tool that's not very expensive to buy to understand exactly what's going on in our bodies. So instead of saying, 
uh, comparing ourselves to this woman or this woman or that man, or does it work or doesn't work? It's just like, you will know it's going to, if it's working or not, because you have this tool, you get up in the morning, you do this and you know, um, you know, what's happening inside the body. You know where your blood glucose levels are. You know, these things that are very, very powerful when it comes to once again, aging well, staying active, being, you know, keeping your brain and your smarts and everything. And it's so easy and it's so affordable now. We, that, those were not things that we were discussing 20 years ago. So this personalized medicine that can work for all of us. And that's what I love about just everything you do. You you bring it back, to, you, you simplify it, you, ex, you, you explain it, you simplify it, but then you also want to make sure and you're personalizing it for people and helping them in the book of how do you personalize this program for whatever your life, you know, whatever they're going through in their life. And, and um, I just think, we're, you know, future of medicine, future of health, future of weight loss is right here. And it's right here in this book. Um, and it just, you know, so it's powerful. So for me, I want everybody to know women, food and hormones. I got my book, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Godfrey, I got my book on Amazon. Um, we're going to, and uh, as we close out, I'll tell you everywhere you can get it, but Sarah, how would you like to leave us today? Well, you, you just wrapped up with a message of empowerment, which I think is so essential here because, you know, when I first tried keto 20 years ago, all we had were those urine strips that you could pee on and see if you were producing ketones. You could also tell from your breath, but those pee sticks don't work very well because they show when you're first in ketosis, but then as the body adapts, they don't reflect what's going on in your blood. They don't reflect what's going on in your brain. So that's where these simple tools, things like you know, the blood ketone meter, checking your blood glucose in the morning with a little finger prick, that allows you to really personalize these diets because we know there's not one size fits all. We know that when it comes to metabolic flexibility, as an example, that what it takes for your body to be flexible is different than what it takes for my body to be flexible. But we can both do testing to see what is the best fit for us. And that allows us to really personalize diet, sleep, lifestyle, connection, like all these things that are so important to our health. Now, I want to close with one other point about this. I, you had asked about tracking and, you know, what are some of the ways to do that? And I mentioned the blood ketones once a day. Some people do twice a day. You can even calculate your glucose ketone index. That's something I talk about in the book. Another thing you can do is you could wear a continuous glucose monitor. So I'm kind of obsessed about this. This is a more advanced <laughs> strategy. You know, I'm obsessed. I've got my little device right here that you can see. And this has really helped me dial in what is the best diet for me? Because it's not that I'm saying you should go on a ketogenic diet for the rest of your life. What I think is the most impactful for metabolic flexibility is to do four weeks of a ketogenic diet, do it the way that we've described with detoxification first, nutritional ketosis, layering in intermittent fasting as a backdoor to ketosis, do that for four weeks. And then you slowly start to add more carbs back. So you go from 25 net grams of carbs per day to 30 the next day, and then you go up to 35 and you figure out, okay, what's the right dose for me? And this more advanced testing, and I'm not talking about for diabetes, I'm talking about for people who are non-diabetics, it can be really helpful to see, okay, what are the carbs that my body likes the best? You know, it turns out I do great with winter squash, but then I spike up to a diabetes level with sweet potato. I have problems with apples, but I can eat bananas. And so that allows me to really personalize and gives me that freedom that I think we're all after. And it gives me that sense of empowerment that I'm not just like a victim trying to choose what to eat and then suffering the consequences. Instead, I can architect what's gonna be the best diet for me. So that's what I think is so empowering. You don't have to have a glucose monitor to do that, a continuous glucose monitor, but we've got these tools that really allow us to determine, okay, what's the best diet for me? Cause it's gonna be a little different than the best diet for you. Can I just ask you, you showed us on your uh, arm there for the listeners who showed uh, Sarah held up her arm. It's on the back of your arm. Is it, is it a tape there? How is it attached? 
So it's a it's a little device about the shape of a quarter. We're gonna have to get one for you, Kathy. I'm gonna I'm gonna get one. I, I after today I'm gonna go. I mean I've I've already know that I'm gonna do this. I was been traveling. I'm back. I'm going after in the next hour. I'm gonna have one. But where do you get them? Or how do you how do you? It's not implanted in your skin, is it? So it is implanted in your skin. There's like a quick little <laughs> process. You can see it on my social media. Every time okay. I change it every two weeks, I make a little video about it, but there's no needle. There's a little sensor that's about the size of a hair, the diameter of a hair that measures just under your skin, oh. what your glucose is 24 wow. seven. So it allows you to, um, to know how you react to food. So like all the food that I just told you about that I ate today, is shown on my little device here. Like you, for those who can see the video, oh, yeah, like you, you can only see a white screen, but yeah, I, 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 I see. Uh, well, that's, that, that is, so you in, you, I know you're a doctor, so you would do it anyway, but anybody can just put it under their skin or you have to go, oh yes, yeah, so you could just buy it. You go to the store, you buy it and I can slip it under my skin. So in the U S you have to have a prescription for okay. it. So okay. you can ask your doctor for a prescription, but there's also a number of companies that are direct to consumer that take care of that process for you. So they have a telehealth questionnaire process and those okay. companies all in your book too, right? It's, it's in my book. Yeah. Okay. I will just buy it. I'm going to go to that chapter. I'm going to read it. That is so that is, that is great. I mean, that is classic. I'm definitely going to do it. I'm going to do it at least, you know, at least for a couple of months just to see it's, I, I, I bet it's just mind boggling how our bodies, as you said, I can sort of feel like, I think I do well on bananas. When everybody used to say bananas are, you know, going to spike your blood sugar, et cetera. I'm thinking I actually do bet well on bananas. Um, I feel good on bananas. So anyway, Sarah, it's always a pleasure. We will talk again. Uh, I, I know I know because uh, I love you to death and so, do, so, so does the audience. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Kathy. So appreciate you. Bye-bye now. Bye.